Hello everyone, my name is Tiago Canera. I'm a neuroscience PhD student in, in Lisbon, in the beautiful Champalimau research. If you haven't visited, I invite you all to come by, give me a ring when you go by Lisbon. And I can hear myself. Ah? <laughs> it's a, hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, wow, well, um, that, that threw me completely off. So the title of the talk is Playing with Neuroscience, How Can We Use Games to Study the Mind and Brain? And uh, somewhere in the middle, I'll talk about a bit about Godot, but I guess this talk is probably one of the ones that is the furthest away from Godot development, and it's more about um, the struggles uh, that uh, we have as scientists trying to make video games. So to talk about how we can use video games to study the mind and brain, first of all, I should probably talk about how can we study the mind and brain, right? So uh, one very important concept uh, that I think is, is uh, probably easy even for you to understand since we're all kind of in the co field of computer science is uh, David Marr's levels of analysis. So David Marr was a famous uh, psychologist uh, slash neuroscientist who came up with a theory with which you could describe systems um, that could process stimuli. Okay? And for him, these were the three main levels that you should describe a system at to really understand it. The first level was the computational level, the second was the algorithmic, and the third one was the implementational. Now, just so you, you, you see how um, it, I got inspired by the, the talk from Mad Dog at, at FOSTEM and uh, how these very big, important people were at some point all in the room together. Here you can see this one is, uh, is David Marr. This is uh, uh, Gigio, which is his co-author in the paper. And this one is uh, Francis Crick, which is the guy who discovered the DNA uh, helix, double helix sequence. And you know they just they were just strolling around. And uh, I'm not showing you this image for no reason. Um, I will ask you to do a little game with me, and it's just to look at the image for one second or two and try to discern its features. Like you can see three men. You can see there's some woods. Maybe this is like close to sundown. Why am I showing you this? Because one of the main examples that we can use to explain Mars levels is the visual system. In our visual system, uh, the computational level for David, and according to David Marr, uh, is the mental representation of what you see. So in this image, your mental representation is what? Is maybe you see three men. Maybe you see sundown. But that's not all that our brain or we as individuals are doing, or we as systems. You can think of it, uh, if you don't want to think of it in, in terms of biological systems, you want to think of it in uh, computational systems, your mental representation could be uh, what your computer um, renders, for example. Now, the algorithmic level is what David Mark calls the uh, cognitive processes. And this is how does the system see what it sees. And in this case, in, in I'm more comfortable explaining in, in, in humans, in the visual system, what happens is that there's some photons bouncing off a surface, and these photons go into our retina, and then we have these photoreceptors, and all of this cripples down, uh, ripples down your brain all the way until you form an image in your visual cortex. And the third level is the molecular level. And that level is very interesting, which is basically the hardware. How is our brain actually uh, doing this? How is it processing this image into making it into a, um, three men? And here I have a, just a small video. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it, but these are neurons, real neurons in the visual cortex firing to a, an image. I don't know which image, but. I don't know. For people who nev have never seen it, this is, I think it's a pretty cool small video. So 
in, uh, in the lab where I work, um, we study the function of neural circuits in systems. And the reason why I, I found it relevant to, to give this little introduction about levels of, of analysis is because in our lab we try to look at systems in all of these three different layers of, of analysis. And uh, to start, oh, sorry, to start my presentation off, I will ask you to play a little game with me, okay? So I'll play this video, and what you have to do is focus on this blue dot here. And then some dots will show up, a cloud of dots will show up on the, on the top part. And what you will have to do is, for yourselves, decide if the dots are moving rightwards or leftwards, okay? It's very easy. And you can see if you got it wrong or right by the color of the response. So now are they moving right or left? So the guy decided right and he was correct. Now it's a bit harder. He, he was right, he was wrong. Are you bored yet? So this is the type of tasks that we, we and w when I say we, I mean the field of psychology and neuroscience uses to study, for example, what I was showing you before, how the brain sees things, how do we compute, how many dots are there. We cannot possibly be counting every single dot. So there has to be some way in which our brain is abstracting the amount of stuff on a screen and putting it into a right or left decision. And uh, why, why this is very interesting, w while this is very interesting, it's also extremely uh, hard to go through because people usually do this for two hours uh, uh, in a row. And it's not just people, this is, uh, but at the same time, this task has an ex uh, a huge advantage. And it is that not only people can do this, but also other types of uh, species can do it. Uh, Rodents can do this type of task, and uh, monkeys can do this type of task. And in those species, we have some advantages um, that we don't have in the humans. That, that is, we can look at their brains directly, whereas in the humans, we have this skull thing that impedes us. So moving forward, my question was, how can we make this task into a game that is enjoyable and that people instead of sitting in the lab for two hours, uh, bored to their bone, could play it at home and have fun, and I could have meaningful data uh, for free, basically, because people are just playing a fun game. Now, the first thing that I found on Google was this, gamification, and the Wikipedia definition. And while very controversial, gamification is exactly what I needed to do, is grabbing this task making it into a game. Now, as controversial as it is, I did learn a, a lot about uh, how to adapt tasks and how to make them into games. And uh, I also like to put this slide in, usually when I, when I give this presentation, to kind of demystify, because I think in the, in the, in the game dev industry, this, this gamification is like a, uh, a horrible concept. But it is quite useful for, um, to have it as a construct, to have this notion that turning things into, into games is, is valuable. Anyways, I didn't look too deep into it because I thought um, I, would, I would make my own fake uh, theory, <laughs> which I called the fun accuracy trade-off. And here, what I'm, s what I'm trying to look at is how can we make a game that is exciting without constraining the state of the internal state of the subject? If you are playing, uh, I don't know, any action game, you are automatically uh, enticed and, and engrossed in this atmosphere that the game is trying to feed you, right? If you're playing a first-person shooter, you, maybe you're stressed. If you're playing maybe uh, Tetris, the new Tetris on VR, maybe you're very relaxed. And uh, we don't want that. We want to have uh, a neutral state in which, uh, similar to the one where you're in the lab looking at those dots. The other one is that actions must have inferable value. I can't just put random 
movement in the game because everything that the person is going to do in this in this game or in the case uh, uh, in this dots task is giving me meaning meaningful information so i should have only variables that have inferable value that means that i can look at and i can say this is three you know you're deciding three out of five or something like that uh, and then this is a very important one i need a limited action space if i have a first person shooter and i have a uh, all this open world and everything, I, won't, I will never be able to uh, computationally figure out what is happening. I won't be able to make, do an equation to, to figure out what's happening. I, uh, and, and with that comes, I have to be able to determine opt optimal policy so that I can know how people are doing, and I have to be able to compare it across subjects. So I put these two examples here. This one, I think you by now you've understood why this game doesn't is not great. And here I put Tetris and I also scratch it out, but it's because it's on the opposite side of the spectrum. And as I put Tetris here, I could put off also, for example, chess. Uh, it is usually said that chess has more possible combinations than, uh, than particles in the universe. So for me, if I wanted to study that, I would be a physicist and I wouldn't be studying brains. So I want something a bit more constrained so that I can look at it. Now, there are some examples out there of people who tried to do this in the scientific field. This one is called the Great Brain Experiment. It's uh, by um, Brown et al. It's the team in, in, in London. Uh, and what they do here is basically they, ha they get, they get the, the, the dots task or similar tasks like that, and they put cute chibi, chibi characters in them. Now, I was, I'm very inclined to say that it's uh, not that exciting of a game. I've tried it a lot. You can also try this on the, all the stores. It's not that exciting, but surprisingly, they got over 12 million players, which 12 million is, is a lot of people. And uh, this, this, I put this here to show you the, the power of the simple fact that we say that people are helping science compels people to just download the thing and, and give it a try, even if it's just the same thing you were doing just a few moments ago, which is super boring with cute graphics. iWire is another really cool initiative uh, where they make this game where they grab slices of brains in, uh, serially, and what you have to do in the game is you have to trace, uh, for example, this part, then they'll show you the bottom layer and you'll have to figure out where it went, and in the end, you'll have some sort of 3D map of a certain pathway. And this is to help them uh, map uh, images of brains that where they're trying to study different circuits. Um, it's, a cool, it's a cool interactive thing, but it's not really a game, per se. There's no feedback loop. There's, um, it's not so interesting. That said, they are hiring uh, game developers soon if you're looking for something. Uh, and then see Hero Quest. Now this is, I see it as the most successful one. So far they have about 4 million active users, which is crazy. And the game is basically you have this boat. In the beginning you see a map of the world and then you have a boat and you have to travel the boat into this map from point A to point B. The only reason why it's not that exciting is because it goes on the opposite direction. It has too many degrees of freedom. And in the end, it's kind of hard for us to study. I mean, not for us because I don't have access to the data, but for them, uh, it's kind of hard to have any meaningful uh, answers because they just have too many variables to explore. Now, someone said most scientific games aren't fun and most games aren't scientific. That was me last night when doing the presentation. <laughs> but I still think it holds. Um, and because of that, I we decided to go about and try it ourselves, try to do it ourselves. So our journey was not one without, um, without troubles. And usually, in, I know in, in computer science maybe it's different, but in science, you usually only pr present the, the glossy finished parts. But I'll go ahead and present to you even my first prototype ever. Um, oh, I should preface it by saying I'm a psychology student, and then I studied philosophy and cognitive science. And uh, my last math class was in ninth grade. Uh, and then I decided to, to start coding. So in the beginning, it was a bit rough. 
Um, uh, in the beginning, I used uh, this engine that I thought would be very easy, Construct. I'm sure some of you may have heard about it. That I, It's very easy. You basically don't need to code. You just drag things around. Uh, but in our, uh, yeah, before that, I should say that in our lab, we study the, uh, the function of neural circuits in, in the mouse and in the human. And you stole that from him. <laughs> you stole my joke. <laughs> um, yeah, um, in the mouse and in the human. This one may not, one, not be one, but I'm pretty sure the ones I, I, I study are. Um, yeah, and uh, just to talk about, briefly mention our tools, um, the tools that we have to our disposal. In the mouse, we have a lot of things we can do that are very, very uh, developed in by, by years and, and uh, decades of, of scientific development. For example, genetic manipulation. We can have mice that are um, uh, genetically manipulated to, to be in a certain way. For example, they may uh, be left-handed or right-handed, for example. Uh, we can do slice physiology. That means after, uh, after the mice are, are sacrificed, we can look at their brains and try and see what happened in their brains while they were living. We can do optogenetics. That's a very, very interesting technique that involves um, uh, the ability to manipulate in a living brain the activity of specific cells. That is, you can basically turn a light on and off, and because these cells have photoreceptors, uh, you can turn them on and off. So you can turn them off specific parts of the brain in a living animal. Imaging, we can do, for example, we can put the animal in a resonance, uh, uh, an MRI, uh, which is like, I, I don't know, maybe some of you have done an MRI, this r round cylinder that you go in and it scans your brain. Or we can even put a microscope. You can uh, drill a tiny uh, cavity in the, in the skull of the animal, and you can look at the actual brain behaving. And of course, we can look at the behavior. We can just put the animal in a small box and see what it does in uh, certain tasks. Now, in the humans, um, while in theory we could do all of those, ethically, we cannot. Uh, but we can do um, other things. We can do non-invasive imaging, again, MRI. We can put someone in a scanner, ask them what, they're, what they see, what, how, what they're doing. And we can look at more complex behavior. Now, we can do one other thing. And, and this thing, to me, personally, is the most interesting and, and rich thing. And it's the only thing that you can only get out of a human and no other species. Does anyone have a... An intuition, whatever it is. It's yeah, it's their report, right? So we can ask them. So what what was it like? How did you do it? And this, uh, well, while there's a lot of progress, for example, in the monkey field, I mean, it's still not doable. In humans, we can just ask anyone what they did. Now, so the first task that I'm talking about uh, is. Uh, called the foraging task. It was mostly developed by, by Pietro, is that call it my colleague of mine over there, and many, many others. And the reason why I put it here is because in, in science, it, uh, cooperation is very important. And even without knowing, you end up having this mentality that sharing is, is, is very important. And, and, and Pietro developed most of, this pro, uh, most of this project. I came in quite late, um, and my job was basically to turned this task, which was first developed for rodents, into a, a task for humans. And what we, were, what, what we did in this task is to understand how animals make decisions when the environment that you are in is uncertain. So this is uh, just a schematic. You, you don't have to worry about it too much. It, I just put it here. And uh, basically, the problem is very similar to, to that of figuring out if a lighter has fuel or not. Imagine you have a lighter and you want to know if it has fuel, what would you do? You turn it, you try it. Yeah, imagine you cannot see or hear. <laughs> you, you flick it. If you, if you flick it and if it lights, then you know for sure it has gas, otherwise it wouldn't light. Now, if you flick it and it doesn't light, that's the interesting part, because you, you have no idea 
It, you may have missed because lighters sometimes are finicky, or it may actually not have gas, right? So we decided to turn this type of problem, which of course in the, mi in the mice is not using a lighter, is uh, exploring an environment trying to look for, for water, but it's very similar. And uh, we came up with the idea to adapt it to, to humans. Now, okay, slide, go. Now, why did we decide to go to use Godot? And this is a, I think it's a, a relevant slide, uh, especially for, for this crowd. So one thing is that owning your engine, in our case, means owning your data. If I use a proprietary a, a, uh, engine and I'm using their pipeline to get to collect my data, I'm not even sure that I have, uh, uh, maybe I'll be legally called out for, for doing something or I, I, uh, we don't know. And basically we, uh, we want to own our data because that's the most important thing in science. If you don't have data, you have nothing. So we need to also own our, our engine. Second of all, uh, me and my colleagues are very big open source enthusiasts. So we, I mean, we were trying to look for an open source engine to use. This is a big plus, is the fact that you could use several scripting languages. I don't have to relearn uh, how to code to use Godot. I can script it in all sorts of uh, different languages. And that, that was a very exciting thing. And also, I can add my own features. I can add my own packages. I can manipulate it as I see fit. And another one is that it's free, cross-platform. Not everyone in science is an open source enthusiast, so we wanted something that we could share our project with uh, someone using a Mac or a Windows computer. And uh, also buying things as much uh, as uh, money science has, buying things is very complicated because it's always dealing with the state and bureaucracies and that. Uh, so everything that you can get free is a big time saver. So that said, I didn't, yeah, and it works amazing on Linux. I use Linux. <laughs> uh, that said, the first prototype, as I was saying before, was done in, um, in Construct, and that's what it looked like. Beautiful, right? It was really bad. <laughs> it was not fun at all. And um, uh, you basically, you had to explore it with this. This is a, supposed to be a guy, a, a, a soldier. It was really bad. <laughs> uh, and how can we improve it? Code graphically, changing to a different game engine, <laughs> probably all of the above. Uh, this was the second prototype where now you have to this character and you go around between right and left trying to find where that little monster is. This is the third prototype. And this is the one where we collected data. Here we had more decent graphics. I had the help from a, a, a designer who helped me make these graphics. And this one was good enough for people to try. And what did we learn in this, in this thing? So th th rem remember that this is mostly work from, from Pietro in the mouse version. I did the, the human version. In this task, both humans and mice behave accordingly with our model. So we, Pietro developed a model of how uh, animal, the optimal model of how the animal should behave, which is quite straightforward. And even if you don't understand anything, the important thing is that these two uh, lines are very similar to each other. So basically, we found a way in which we could have mice and humans behaving si uh, similarly in a specific task. Why was this very important? First of all, to convince ourselves that it was useful to do this. Because if we can't reproduce the behavior in the, in the other species, then maybe it's not so useful to explore it deeper in humans. And second of all, I, we learned that it's not easy to make a fun and engaging game. Actually, that's, that was the, something that I'm still struggling with, and I'm, I'm sure you also struggle with making fun games is hard, especially with all the constraints that we have. So the challenge here is to find the right balance. Now, in Godot, we have a um, much cooler version uh, that is not ready yet, but it's, it's like an alpha version, but I can show you here. It's an 8-bit game, has uh, uh, original music, that said, it was all done by, by me by, and by two other colleagues, Diogo and Pietro. And uh, I can just show you this small video. You, saw, you can see that it was running on Godot. And uh, yeah, this is a game. Basically, what you are seeing here is exactly the same as the dots task that you saw in the beginning. 
but now you have uh, boss, different bosses. You can play the level. There's 8-bit. You can upgrade your spaceship. You know, it's it's something that is a lot more compelling. Even though it's it's not, we know we know it's not a professional video game. It's still a lot better than the competition that we've seen. So that said, I'm going to talk about the second project that I that I developed. I don't, please let me know if I'm running out of time or no, I'm, I'm good. Um, and this game is called the, the Spinner Game. Now this game was developed by Gotham, myself, and uh, and, and two colleagues, Marta and Guilherme. And basically, um, we studied in this project how do humans decide on complex trajectories. Now here I'm showing you, I'm sure uh, uh, those of you who went to FOSTEM had to open this map about 50 times. It's the map of the <laughs> University of, of, uh, of Brussels. And it's very, I, uh, at least for me, it was very hard to figure out where to go. But still, we, are, we as humans are pretty good at knowing how to navigate. If we know, if we want to go from building H to building C, for example, we can easily see that probably the best route is something like this and this. Uh, but there's, there's many alternatives, but we are pretty good uh, at doing this. And um, so what we decided to do is make a game where people have to navigate a space that is confined, again, because we need this, this constriction to be able to, to study it correctly. We, people have to navigate the space um, but with certain constraints. For example, there's a cost, just like going from building H to building U has a cost. Uh, moving in our game has a cost to emulate that. And then what you have to do is in this game is you have this hexagon. You rotate, you control this, this thing, you move around it. And what you have to do is collect these balls before they reach the edge. If they reach uh, the edge, you lose. And um, this is the this is an old version of of the game that was also done in 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 construct. It's the and basically uh, here I'm showing a very simple graph just to show a small analysis that we did, and it's to show that the the further away the next target is from where you have the, your circle, the the earlier you have to to leave, which is pretty intuitive but still interesting. And here we're showing you. In black, the the next dot that is coming out, and in the colors, the gaze position of two different people. So we use a lot of these tools that I was telling you. For example, one of them is eye tracking. We can see where people are looking and try to use that information to predict where they're going to move next. And indeed, what what we can see is that we can they mostly follow the biggest one, but they also move to the next one before moving there. So we can predict where they're going to move by just looking at where they're looking. Now, in Godot, we made a much more interesting version. And this one, actually, we're trying to look for some feedback. So if you have an Android phone and you want to try it, you can just go here, download the APK. Or you can go here to the, my GitHub and check out the repository. Basically, it's a, a puzzle version of the previous version. And what you have to do here is exactly the same. So you have to go around. You have to know when to collect things. But yeah, things are, every time you move, things go outwards one, one iteration. Um, this is actually an old build. Now it looks much nicer. Uh, we fixed a lot of things. And one, one very interesting aspect about this game is that it's entirely generated in the engine. There's no sprites. Uh, there's no audio. The audio and the visuals, they're all generated in the engine, which was something that we found actually easier for us since we're more like uh, used to coding than drawing things. So we just made everything in the engine with a nice, it was very easy to learn. So yeah, if you want to, also if you want to try it out without downloading because my APK may be contaminated with all sorts of things and you don't trust me. I think it's very fair. Uh, you can try it here on my tablet, which I'll pass around. Wait, it's not loading. Yeah. So, go ahead. You can try it out if you want. Um, so, what did we find with this game? 
Again, making a good game is not easy at all. However, it's not impossible to study many variables in a game that is continuous and is fun. Uh, there is immense potential in this framework, in this type of framework, for scientific purposes, as we saw, for example, in the examples I gave before that have millions of players. Another thing is we have too many volunteers, which is a problem no one ever had in science. Everyone wants to come do our task because their alternative is looking at dots for two hours. Looking forward, uh, we want to deploy our game online. So it will happen soon. Oh, uh, I don't know if anyone is playing right now the, the beta game. I forgot something extremely important, which is uh, by playing it, you are sending data to my server anonymously, but still you are sending it. I will go ahead and delete. If you don't want me to save your data, just come here and say it now and I will delete it but I don't collect any information. It's just basically where you touch and, and uh, when you touch it. It's not uh, Google mind reading. So what we want, to exactly, unlocking the potential. Huh? And study other dimensions of behavior. So now that we've this settled that we can use games to study scientific uh, questions, we can mimic other classical experiments, not only the dots task, but many other tasks that have historically been studied. Uh, we can pro probe subjects on their personality traits. We can ask them, so how, how, how are you feeling, for example, while they play the game? And we can correlate those types of measures to the, their behavior in the game. We can study pathology. We can give this game to people that have uh, mental health uh, disorders and see if they are any different. We can look at all these other variables, uh, age, gender, etc. Uh, and just to finish, I just want to highlight that we are, we are not alone uh, in doing these things. Uh, this colleague of mine, Vittoria, she made this game where you're in a VR environment and um, they, they study how, um, how, do you, how much attached do you feel to a virtual limb that you have in virtual environment. So she, first of all, she puts a limb in there that is perfectly coherent with yours. So most people say that, yeah, it's, it's my arm. But then she starts offsetting it, so you have a bit of lag. And then at some point, you lose uh, the, the connection with the limb, and you start saying that, no, it's not your arm. She also uh, studies things like, for example, uh, race. So you can put a uh, different colored arm or, 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 or sex. You can put a different... Uh, gendered arm and you can study how much you feel connected to that arm. It's a very, very interesting study. Here, this colleague of mine, Nunu, also from the Champalimo, uh, I, oh, I can play it? Well, too bad. Uh, they, they have, they've developed a, a, a virtual reality game where you control an airplane using your, your brain activity. So it's, it's really interesting. You can, by thinking, oh, uh, you don't have access, whatever. By thinking about uh, where you want to turn, uh, and with some training, then you can control, in place you can play an airplane game just using your brain, which is pretty cool, at least for me. Now, uh, that said, I just want to acknowledge a few people. Pietro, which is my biggest collaborator, and he developed the first project I talked about. Gotham is my collaborator in the second project. Zachary Manin is my supervisor, my boss, who pays for me and helps me and supports me a lot. Shira and Diogo are the artists that helped me make the, 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 the first game I talked to you about. Nuno and Vittoria developed these games, all of the Godot community for all the efforts for making this possible for me, and all of my lab. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer anything Yeah, so, yes, yes okay, uh, so you're asking how we generate the audio in-game. It's kind of uh, cheating, so basically we have uh, MIDI, and then we play the, the MIDI file mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the animation player, and we just have, uh, so the game is, the engine is playing the audio, and it's not like a clip. So we have the MIDI notes, and it just plays the notes. 
Yeah, it, it's like basically MIDI notes. Uh, but it's like one note, and then I yeah. just shift it up and up and down. Uh, did you already install this uh, in your version to the Archipel or something? Mm. No, <laughs> no, we have we have published in a, in a conference, so we have presented our results, um, but we don't have anything that you can access online uh, available because it's uh, the the publishing process is very excruciating in science and you know you have to you want to make sure that you have a very high impact uh, publication that everyone will read so uh, more for uh, no soon soon we will have in uh, <laughs> yeah exactly you can go to soon trademark <laughs> exactly <laughs> It will if you follow me on on Kitab or on Twitter. I have the same handle. Uh, is my last name? It's very easy. I'm everywhere with my last name. Are you on ResearchGate? ResearchGate. I'm also on ResearchGate. Yes. Um, that said, I'm a very young student. I just started my PhD, so I don't have a lot to show <laughs> on the ResearchGate. <laughs> Thank you. No more questions. Yeah. 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 That's that's a great question. So what we did, uh, the question was how 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 are we going to do? We're not going to collect. Uh, are we going to collect other types of data other than the movements that people do on the screen? And if not, will we get um, significant data with just that? So what we did is we did a, we, we opted for a hybrid strategy. So we collected about uh, 30 people in the lab with all of the sensors, uh, eye tracking, breathing rate, uh, stress response. Uh, uh, your your transpiration of your skin, um, accelerometers in, in your in your muscles and electric uh, EMG, which is basically uh, detects the electrical difference in, in basically your muscle activity. We collected all of this in the lab, um, and then we're going to have a different sample, which is people playing online, and hopefully we can cluster these online population based on their behavior. We can correlate with the Psychophysics measurements, and we will have some sort of idea that, for example, groups who move in this pattern are most likely to behave or have physiological measures in that in that pattern. That said, one of the big things of this study is we we ran it we ran the the human behavior versus against um, some algorithms, some. Um, reinforcement learning algorithms and some neural network algorithms, which is basically AI that solves our games. And we, we try to compare it and see how different types of AI that are given uh, different priors, different prior knowledge, beat the game in different ways. So one cool finding that I can tease at is that, for example, if we give a naive AI, so an AI that knows nothing except the rules of the game, which is basically would be similar to a human when they start, it performs much worse than humans in the first level. But then once it's built up uh, a nice database of how to play the game, it completely curses uh, the humans. But uh, the, if we add to that AI some priors, for example, if we, instead of uh, showing them just a map of ULB, we say that going straight between two points is probably better than going around, then it mimics uh, the, the human behavior. So it becomes better in the beginning, but worse in the end, which is quite interesting. Uh, have people uh, tried to make your own game mm -hmm. for the, this kind of research? I'm trying to see uh, if uh, existing games, <laughs> if some uh, existing games are uh, fitting what you were looking for before trying to do your own. Yeah. So the question is, did I did we try to look at games that could be fitting to answer our scientific questions? before going into um, doing our own? The answer is yes, we did look a lot. Um, 
and uh, there were some that were appropriate. The problem is uh, that we need data, right? If we only needed the game, that would be fine, but we need data. So if there's some developer, we need the permission of the developer to collect data from their game. And we pro they probably won't have the data we need, so we would have to alter the game. So if it's not an open source game, then it's, it's very hard to do. And as you know, there are not that many uh, open source games, and the ones that are are maybe not so easy to find. So, yeah, that's why we opted to do our own, which we understand now is uh, probably not the best idea. But <laughs> no, we are now actually collaborating in in this uh, in this game that I showed you, the last game, with a, a professional game studio, which is helping us do the onboarding and um, improving a bit the graphics and and all of that. Sorry, sorry, could you repeat? Uh, about analytics, uh -huh. like the companies are doing that from sometimes from the same way, the same content, it's very high level, like, uh, you know, complex things, complex things, you have to try to make, now we have data works, so we have to think of how many more data. Yeah, so um, the comment was that um, although there are not many people looking at, for example, the details that people do in, the, in studying the, those and comparing those to uh, between across subjects, there's a lot of people doing uh, with more high level analytics about like, do people complete the game? How many people complete the game? How many players do this specific type of strategy uh, in more complex games? And um, he's interested to see what would come out if you look deeper. Enlighten, no. I would be, I would be very happy to. Okay. Yeah, well, we can, we can chat afterwards. Anyone has another question? Yeah, so uh, the, qu the answer, the, the question is, did we think about uh, basically putting, having the scientific task be a specific part of a game where you can uh, get boosted? Y yes, but I don't like that kind of uh, practice. <laughs> I hate games with ads or with the, uh, yeah, do this to, it's like they're blackmailing me to, <laughs> to do something. And w one very important thing is that we need, not only for ethical purpose, but for scientific purpose that the participation is voluntary. So we, we don't want people to be doing this for money or for, actually it's, it's illegal. We, you cannot ask uh, uh, particip scientific participants to do stuff for rewards. So we need people to do this spontaneously because out of their own free time, they decide to grab the thing and do it. Uh, and I do realize it's much tougher than just bundling it with, uh, with something else. Although we do have some similar ideas, for example, if you are really good, then we have um, we have different modes that will answer different scientific questions. So, for example, if you've if we think that you have given us enough data of your behavior, then we unlock different modes that explore different scientific questions. I, I didn't meant to make money or something, but in-game money, let's say. Yeah, for yeah. Example, you play Candy Crush, and then uh, you get more time when you solve the puzzle before. Mm. Yeah. yeah, could be. <laughs> I think that, as you say, then the motivation of giving the data is different, so the risk Correct. might also be taken. Correct, so exactly. You're playing this to gain something, and that's how also how it works when you do the stuff on bikes. You have to give the incentive and everything. But Correct. It's better when you don't have the data after working. So exactly. So the comment was that uh, if you change the intrinsic motivation to perform a task, you may change the behavioral outcome that you get out of it. And um, that's one thing that we have to worry about amongst many, 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 many 
things that we have to worry about. That's another one. So yeah, we just basically try to make our job harder every day. <laughs> Correct. So the the stream asked if uh, it would be uh, why would we why why would we not use, for example, more complex games? Uh, and the answer is exactly that it's probably too complicated to analyze, and also uh, it may not answer the specific scientific questions we are looking for in our specific lab in our specific work group. So. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.